Today our topic is transcendental arguments. It's a very special kind of argument. It's one first found in the work of Immanuel Kant, who writes the Critique of Pure Reason and includes within it a big section called the Transcendental Deduction. In the first edition it takes one form, it takes a second form in the second edition. He almost completely rewrites the argument there. And it is the critical argument of the work. It's also the one that people most associate with Kant. But if we analyze the form of the argument, I think we'll see that it has a very general structure, and you can find it in all sorts of places in the history of philosophy. It's a very powerful kind of argument, and not only subsequently to Kant have philosophers thought a lot about it, people like Hegel and Heidegger, for example, but also if you go back in time, I think you can find similar arguments in Plato, in Augustine, in Anselm, in a variety of other thinkers who are all contemplating this general kind of structure. Now what is a transcendental argument? Well, let's start with a much simpler form of argument to which it bears a close relation. That is to say, modus ponens. Modus ponens is often taken to be the fundamental form of inference. In fact, in some logical systems, it is the only rule of inference. And it says this, if P then Q, P therefore Q. Let's write that out in a more precise and more abstract form. Here's the general structure of an argument from modus ponens. We have some sentence, let's just say A, and then we have a claim, if A, then B, we conclude, therefore, B. Okay, so if it's sunny out, the streets aren't wet, it is sunny out, so the streets aren't wet. Or, if Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's a very simple form of argument, familiar to most of us. Anybody who's studied introductory logic knows all about modus ponens, or it's sometimes called a rule of conditional exploitation or conditional elimination. And so it's a very familiar kind of logical structure. Now then, what's a transcendental argument? It makes a few small changes in the form of modus ponens, but it does it in a way that makes that argument immensely powerful. So, at first it's going to seem like magic, but I'll argue it isn't magic. So first of all, what's the change? Well, we take that premise, A, and we simply weaken it, actually, to possibly A. It's possible that A, in other words. And so you might think, well, gee, okay, <laughs> I don't see how that's going to help me. I now have a weaker premise. Well, it's going to be a huge advantage if I can get the same or an even stronger conclusion out of a weaker premise. That makes it a much more powerful argument. So let's take that, possibly A. Now I simply say, well, <laughs> if possibly A, then B. But I want this not only to be true, but necessarily true. So I'm going to say necessarily, if possibly A, then B. You might think, okay, okay, I see. It's just modus ponens with, instead of A, possibly A. So if po possibly A, if possibly A, then B, therefore B. Huh, that's no big deal. Indeed, that would be no big deal. But look what I'm going to write. I'm not going to write down B. I'm going to write down necessarily B. So what have I done? First of all, I've replaced A over here in the premises with possibly A. So first big change is that I've weakened what I need for those premises. At least I've weakened this premise. I don't need that A is even true anymore. I just need that it's possible. Second major change is that I've changed the antecedent of this conditional correspondingly. Well, okay, that does make this a stronger conditional. Now it's not just saying that if A is true, B follows. It's saying if A is even possible, B follows. So that's making a stronger, much more powerful claim. So if I've weakened this, I've strengthened this. But I've also strengthened it in another way. I've said necessarily. I've said that connection is necessarily true. Now a lot of the connections we talk about in ordinary life are not like that. They're contingent connections. They don't have to be necessarily true. And so if that's the case, you could say, well, this isn't going to work because the connection I have in mind is not necessary. This is a form of argument that won't work in those contingent contexts, but it will work when we're dealing with logic, when we're dealing with metaphysics, when we're dealing with things where there really are necessary connections. It may even work in natural science when we're thinking about scientific laws, 
because there we have in mind law-like, necessary connections between things. And so it's quite plausible in those cases to say, look, it doesn't just so happen, for example, that if I release this, it will fall. There's a necessity to that. If I release this, it has to fall. And so whenever we've got that kind of necessity to our connection, this is a form of argument that we could apply. Now, the conclusion is really the big change, though. I don't just get it is a fact that B. I get B is necessary. It is a necessary truth that B. And that's a much more powerful conclusion. Now, why does this even follow? It's something that doesn't follow in every system of modal logic. There are systems for possibility and necessity that would say this form of argument does not work. But it works in the most popular and the oldest form of modal logic, the logic of possibility and necessity. It's called S5, after the work of C.I. Lewis, who developed five systems of modal logic, and S5 was the most powerful one. This is the system that is taken for granted by figures including Anselm, Aquinas, Leibniz, Kant, and so on. And here's what it says. Necessity is truth in all possible worlds. Possibility is truth in some possible worlds. So we could think of it this way. Imagine a class of possible worlds. These are possible circumstances, possible situations, if you will, cases to which we might apply these various claims about metaphysics, about law-like connections in science, about logic, and so forth. And so we're thinking of these as our possibilities. Now, I'm going to put us here. Let's let this world, W0, be the actual world. We're actually here. In this world, what do we know? Well, possibly A is true in our world here. And so I'm going to write that as logicians would, not with the word possibly, but with a diamond to represent possibility. Okay, so A is not necessarily true here, but possibly A is. What can we infer from that? Well, necessarily, if possibly A, then B. So since this is a necessary truth, this connection holds in every possible world, it holds here. So if possibly A is true here, B is true here. Okay, so far so good. That would give us this conclusion. That's really just an application of modus ponens. We didn't need the necessarily at all. But now, what else can we infer? How do we get this necessarily? Well, possibly A is true here. And I said that possibly a means that A is true in some possible worlds. So let's take one of those worlds. We'll call it W1 and assume that A is true in that world. So we go to that world W1, this other situation where A is true. Right now I'm wearing a yellow striped shirt. I could be wearing a blue shirt. So here it's possible for me to wear a blue shirt. In this world I'm actually wearing the blue shirt. Well, good. What's true here? Well, if A is true there, of course, possibly A is also true at that world. But in addition, since it's a necessary truth that if possibly A, then B, B is true at that world. Okay, so far so good. But we want to know whether B is true in every single world, not just in some possible world. So far, all we get out of that is something we could have gotten anyway, which is, well, possibly B. So, big deal. That gives me B's truth in some possible worlds, but not in all of them. To establish that, I need to show that B is true in just some arbitrarily selected world. Any world at all that we pick out of this set. So I'm going to pick some arbitrary world over here. Let's call it W2. And I need to convince you that B is true there. Why would that be true? Well, look at it this way. A is true here, right? And it's one of these possibilities. That means from the point of view of this world, well, A is possible. Here's a situation where it would hold. So we can say, look, A isn't necessarily true down in this world, but possibly A is because A is true up there. Now I've said, hey, wait a minute. It's a necessary truth that if possibly A, then B. So B has to hold good in this world. Ooh, be true here, be true here be true in this arbitrarily selected world. Now, I didn't pull any tricks there. After all, you might say, well, that works for this world. Will it work for any other world? Yeah. Let's take W3. Possibly A is going to be true here because of that world. And so, big surprise, B has to be true with that world. Pick any world in here that you like, B has to be true. That means B is necessarily true. 
something that logicians would write with a box to indicate necessarily. B is a necessary truth, but that's exactly the conclusion we wanted. Moreover, take a look at all these other worlds. Because no matter where we pick in here, B is going to have to be true, all of these worlds will be B worlds, which means that in every single one of these worlds, we don't just get B, we get necessarily B. Now, in general, that form of argument is one that assumes that all of these worlds are in it together. And what I mean is to say that all of them define a sphere of possibility that is the sphere of possibility for all of them. Now, for certain kinds of necessity, that seems pretty reasonable. Metaphysical necessity, logical necessity, it seems like, yes, we can talk about the logically possible worlds, or the metaphysically possible worlds. That's not something, for example, that changes over time. But on the other hand, there are lots of senses of possibility where things do change over time and we can't go back. So, for example, what can I do with the rest of my life? Well, there are lots of things I can do, but I can't change the past. And so what I've done in the past, I can't change. I can change the future, but I can't change the past. And that tells you that as we go along through time, the sphere of our options, the sphere of our possibilities tends to shrink. Of course, I might develop a new skill and all of a sudden new things become possible for me. So the range of possibilities changes over time. That is to say, the real possibilities for a human life, what Heidegger would call my horizon, is something that can shrink, but maybe can also expand depending on how I think about abilities, capacities, and so on. However, here in the realm of all, as you might say, logically possible situations, or all physically possible situations, maybe if I'm abstracting from where I am now in time and just thinking about all possible physical configurations of the universe, or I'm thinking about all metaphysical possibilities, then this principle seems quite reasonable. There is just one set of all the possibilities, and they all are relevant to all the others. And when I've got that kind of situation, this form of argument works. So far I've been talking about the logic of this situation. The logic of transcendental arguments. But you might say, well, big deal. Okay, I see the logical point. You weaken a, an important premise, you get a much stronger conclusion, and you do it by making those two changes in the other premise. Good for you. That's very interesting. But what can you do with this? Well, I've said it was Immanuel Kant who really first gave these their name of transcendental arguments and brought people's attention to them. And here's what he does with it. This is a passage from the Critique of Pure Reason. All necessity, without exception, is grounded in a transcendental condition. There must therefore be a transcendental ground of the unity of consciousness in the synthesis of the manifold of all our intuitions. This must consequently also be a transcendental ground of the concept of objects in general, and so of all objects of experience, a ground without which it would be impossible to think any object for our intuitions. For this object is no more than that something, the concept of which expresses such a necessity of synthesis. At one other point, he says it even more directly and clearly, this original and transcendental condition is no other than transcendental apperception. But what is Kant doing here? He's saying, in order for me to have, not just if I have experience, then I have, for example, a unity of consciousness, a transcendental apperception, or something of that kind, so I do. He is saying, experience of the world is possible. Experience of objects is possible. Experience of myself is possible. What makes those possible? What are the necessary conditions for the possibility of something? A transcendental argument is an argument about the necessary conditions for the possibility of something. So let's take a look at this premise. If possibly A, then B. I'm asking about the necessary conditions of the possibility of something. The things that are necessary conditions for something not just to be true, but even to be possible. That's what a transcendental argument is all about. And so Kant is saying, how could I have experience of the world? How could I have experience of objects in the world? Hume convinced him that actually my experience is highly varied. It's, it's a manifold of intuition, as he puts it. That is to say, my senses give me just this huge flux of in information. It's not just experience, as if it's one thing, actually. It's a matter of thoughts and feelings and perceptions, and the perceptions are combinations of, well, visual elements, 
auditory elements. I can smell, I can taste, I can touch. I may have a sense of motion. There are all these things that go into my senses and somehow they all get put together into a unified perception. And then I combine those perceptions into an object and then I categorize that object as, for example, a hand or a marker or a whiteboard or a camera. And what I'm doing when I do that is a multi-stage process of combining sensations into sensations of an object and then thinking in terms of the category of that object. That object I recognize as a something. It's a this such, as Aristotle would have put it, a substance, this hand. And so what's happening here is I've got some perceptions, then across time I have other perceptions of the hand, and I end up saying that's a hand. And I group all those together as one object. How do I do that? There must be something that enables me to do it. There must be a unity in consciousness where I put all this stuff together and it gets unified somewhere. His objection to Hume is that Hume just has a bundle here, but there's nothing that can do the bundling. There is nothing that can put them all together. No place where all of those perceptions, thoughts, feelings, and so forth can be combined into one thing. For that combination to be possible, he says, it is a necessary truth that I have to have a unity of consciousness, the transcendental unity of our perception. Moreover, I must have innate concepts, things that he considers the categories. The logical functions of judgment give us the clue to the categories. They are necessary conditions for the possibility of that last stage of my grouping these perceptions under the heading of some concept or other. And then, Sometimes connecting those concepts, connecting those things, seeing the links between objects, the relations between them. Well, that general form of argument is something that then has this structure in Kant. Experience of objects is possible. I'm doing it right now. Necessarily, if it's possible, then there must be a unity in consciousness. So necessarily there is a unity in consciousness, the thing that he calls the transcendental unity of our perception. This form of argument had been found earlier in Descartes. In fact, it's how Descartes tries to break out of just having the I think, I am, as things of which he can be certain. Many readers have said, wait, he goes from I think, I am, I can be sure of that, to suddenly, I can trust my clear and distinct ideas. And they say, well, wait, I, that you can trust one or two clear and distinct ideas. I don't see why you get to trust all of them, that seems like a bad inference. And so they've accused him of committing a fallacy. But from this point of view, it's not a fallacy. What he's saying is, I have complete faith that I am. I have complete faith that I think. If I doubt either one of those, well, doubting is thinking, first of all, it's actually I am doubting, so there must be a me to do the doubting. Consequently, he ends up saying, look, it is possible for me to be certain of something. But what are the necessary conditions for the possibility of certainty? Well, I have a clear and distinct perception that the I think could not be false. I have a clear and distinct perception that I am could not be false as long as I'm here to think it or say it. So, now I look and I say, aha, so it is possible for me to be certain of some things, but necessarily, if I'm certain of something, then I've got to be able to trust my clear and distinct perceptions. So necessarily, I can trust my clear and distinct perceptions. We find a similar form of argument in a lot of other thinkers. In later thinkers, for example, in Heidegger, he begins to ask, well, Kant, you did a great job. You've said it is a necessary condition for the possibility of experience of objects that I have a unity of consciousness, your transcendental unity of our perception. But now, what are the necessary conditions for the possibility of that? And in fact, what are the necessary conditions for the possibility of existence, of being, not just of the I think, I am, but of anything being at all? And those are questions that lead Heidegger into very deep metaphysics, and by the end of his thinking, really into saying whatever the answer is, it's inexpressible. <laughs> Language cannot take me there. Conceptual thinking cannot take me there. But we can back up in time. I think a similar form of argument takes place even in Plato, where Plato's thinking, 
look, it is possible for me to categorize things, for me to recognize something as a triangle, for example, but what are the necessary conditions for the possibility of the recognition of something as a triangle? Well, if, I, uh, if it's possible for me to see that thing as a triangle, I must be able to apprehend the concept of triangularity. I must have the concept of triangularity, and I can have it only by apprehending triangularity. So necessarily, I apprehend the form of triangularity. We see this in Anselm in the ontological argument. And here, I think, there's a brilliant twist. Because Anselm notices, actually, what if A and B are the same thing? So what would we get then? We would get, well, <laughs> possibly, and here I'll just use G for God exists. And I'll use, to simplify the writing, I'll just put the diamond and the box for possibly and necessarily. He says, look, it is possible that God exists. God is that the greater than which cannot be conceived. And I have that, the idea of that. It's certainly conceivable. I think that what is conceivable is possible. Now, potentially big jump, big place you could object right there. Maybe we should read this as it's conceivable that G, to be faithful to what he says, but for the moment, just go with me. Okay, possibly God exists. But wait a minute, if it's possible that God exists, then God exists. And I'm going to say that whole thing is necessary. Conclusion, necessarily God exists. Notice what I've done. I've just replaced A and B with G, God exists here. And I get, if it's even possible for God to exist, then God does exist. In other words, God's existence can't be contingent. It would be equivalent to say, if God exists, then God exists necessarily. Maybe we can turn this around and you would find it more plausible if I simply say, well, yeah, that, that seems kind of like cheating. But let's do it this way. If God exists, then necessarily God exists. Conclusion necessarily God exists. That more clearly says God's existence can't just be contingent. If God exists at all, God is necessarily existent. So I think Anselm's ontological argument has the same logical structure. It too is a transcendental argument. It's saying God's existence is a necessary condition for the possibility of God's existence, for in effect God's conceivability. And then, once we see that, we can recognize the argument that Descartes uses in the third meditation has the same basic structure. It looks like a causal argument, and it goes into complexities about formal and objective reality, and so almost no other philosopher has said that argument is worth really trying to resuscitate or take seriously. But from this point of view, it's not so strange. What we're really saying there is, well, something closely related to Anselm, but not quite the same, He's saying here, it's possible for me to have a concept of God. I do have the idea of God, he says. I have an idea of a perfect being. But necessarily, if it's even possible for me to have such a concept, then God must exist. And here's the causal part of the argument. Where else could I have gotten the concept? So he argues, since I can't explain any acquisition of that concept from experience, it must be a priori. But how could it be a priori unless God put it there? In any case, I'll leave that part out. But I think that's part of how he supports this claim, that God's existence is a necessary condition for the possibility of me even thinking of God. So it's possible for me to think of God, but a necessary condition for the possibility of thinking about God is the existence of God. So necessarily God exists. That, in a nutshell, is the third meditation argument for God's existence. Well, all of these arguments from Plato, from Anselm, from Descartes, from Kant, from Heidegger, have this same basic structure. It's a very powerful sort of structure. And it's a structure that I think you need to take seriously and think hard about, because you're going to find this popping up in philosopher after philosopher. Not only philosophers of historical significance, but on the contemporary scene as well. So the critical question behind any transcendental argument is simply this. What are the necessary conditions for the possibility of something? And if that thing is even possible, then those necessary conditions aren't just conditions that hold, they hold necessarily.